Hello everyone, welcome to the course on uh, biostatistics and design of experiments. Uh, today we are going to talk about design of experiments, it is also called DOE. Um, design of experiments are extremely important uh, if you want to do a well planned out uh, study of a very complicated system. If you do not plan your uh, study properly, then um, the whatever data you collect will be completely wrong. You will not have a statistical basis for analysis and statistical basis for coming to a conclusion. So, design of experiments is very important and it is not taught in uh, many courses. Um, many of the softwares, but uh, have a facility to um, give out designs of various types and um, most of you might not be aware how these softwares uh, spew out these uh, different types of uh, designs. So, we are going to talk about uh, in the next uh, few classes how one goes about uh, designing or planning the experiments and how do you vary the variables and so on actually. So, some of these references um, I, am, I have uh, listed out here. So, if you have access to these references that will be very useful for you. Um, there is a reference relates to life sciences and then there is one on design analysis. This is also understanding industrial design experiments. I do make use of this book also. This is quite uh, simple and um, very practical. Um, and so, I think you should have a book uh, for yourself um, so that uh, do not just rely on a software all the time. You should get the philosophy of how the designs are done and um, if you understand it, it is extremely interesting and very fascinating actually. Okay? So, why do you need to do experiments? Actually, this is a fundamental question. Why should I do uh, experiments? Why should uh, I have a design of experiments? So, design of experiments is a statistical methodology for systematically investigating input output. Okay? So, you may have several inputs and you may have several outputs also like uh, for example, my carbon concentration, nitrogen concentration, uh, the pH, the temperature, the agitator, RPM, the amount of oxygen uh, bubbled, uh, these could be input. My output could be uh, amount of uh, say biopolymer produced, amount of biomass produced, amount of secondary metabolites produced, so a lot of outputs. So, you could have several inputs, several outputs and each of them may behave differently for different inputs. These inputs are called x's, independent variables, um, parameters and so on. The output is called generally the dependent variable the y. Okay? So, we do these experiments to identify important design variables. You may have hundreds of variables but only few of them may be important. So, if you are running a plant, you are interested to know uh, which ones I should focus on, which x's should I think about having a good control on. Okay? So, I do not have to spend money on uh, looking at other x's, so I focus only on the important x's. Optimize my product and process uh, design. This is very important. Ultimately, you want to get the best out of your plant you want to minimize the energy usage, you know, raw material usage and get maximum amount of your desired product, whether it is a biopolymer or whether it is a secondary metabolite or whether it is an antibiotic. I want to maximize its production and minimize my raw material usage. That is obvious, right? That is called optimization. And similarly, if I am doing a product design, I want to improve the quality of the product, product which will have the best uh, say tensile strength or compressive strength or flexural strength or maximum reliability and so on. So, that is called the optimizing the product design. <coughs> Achieve robust performance. Ultimately, we want uh, the uh, say a bioreactor to be robust. Uh, it should not uh, go out of control for small changes in your excess. You know, if the temperature changes by 1 degree, we do not want a very large change in my product amount and quality. So, that is called a robust design. How um, the process is able to absorb small, small changes in your uh, inputs. For example, raw materials can have uh, uh, different amounts of uh, impurities. Um, will that affect too much of my product uh, concentration, product purity? If it affects too much, then I need to have a very pure raw material. Okay? So, even for uh, small variations in um, the raw material concentration, if my product uh, co concentration or yield changes a lot, then it is not very robust. But uh, whereas, if it can absorb the concentrations of the impurity present in the raw material and still give me the desired amount of product, the desired quantity and concentration, then that is called a robust design. 
Uh, this is uh, design of experiments is very, very important in product process development. So, if you are moving from a small scale that is lab scale going right up to a manufacturing scale without performing a design of experiments, you cannot jump, just jump and start making in a large scale. Uh, this is very commonly used by chemical engineers, by process engineers, um, okay, uh, in any manufacturing, whether you are manufacturing a chemical. Uh, whether you are manufacturing antibiotics, whether you are manufacturing metabolites, secondary metabolites, whatever be it, um, unless you do a proper design of experiments, um, you cannot move from small scale to large scale, you cannot expect to have an optimum process with the minimum raw material and energy usage and maximum product yield and desired product concentration. Okay? So, that is what we are going to talk and um, I will be talking about how one varies the various uh, x's or various input parameters uh, to achieve the maximum uh, information as well as maximum output, desired output. So, we are going to do a control changes to input variables to gain maximum amount of information. So, this is called a cause effect relationship. We need to have design of experiments performed so that we can develop regression relationship. We will talk about regression also later. So, we want to develop equations like yield of my desired product is equal to um, function of various input parameters. right? So, in order to de derive such an equation, um, I need to perform experiments. So, that gives you a cause and effect. You know, I may develop equations like this, right? Uh, the yield is equal to um, function of temperature, pressure, uh, dissolved oxygen and so on. So, it may be a linear relation, non-linear relation. Um, could be anything actually. Okay? Now, this is um, more efficient, design of experiment is more efficient than changing one variable at a time. Imagine I want to look at temperature, pH and uh, rpm that is agitator rpm. Um, it is not very um, intelligent just to ch do experiments by changing temperature alone, few experiments changing temperature alone, then keep everything constant. Then now keep temperature also constant, change pH alone, different values of pH, then keep all of them constant, then change rpm alone, different values of rpm. That is called one variable at a time or one factor at a time and uh, that is not very, very efficient because it, it will not be able to identify interactions. You know what is interaction. I talked about the interaction um, many times in ANOVA, two-way ANOVA, three-way ANOVAs. So, when you change only one factor, uh, you will not be able to identify whether there is an interaction between two factors like temperature and pH may be having interaction. Um, unless you simultaneously change this, you will not be able to study those effects. Okay? Uh, also statistical software also have in the market these design of experiments. I, like I said, you know, um, it can spew out uh, different types of designs. These packages can do that actually. So, it does not require much intelligence at all. So, what are the activities involved in DOE? First, you need to prepare the design. Okay? We will talk about it in the next few classes. How do we prepare? Once we have the design um, which gives you the different uh, uh, levels of the input parameters, okay? then you go to the lab or plant and collect the data. If your output or desired um, uh, dependent variable uh, is uh, biomass, so, you measure biomass at different input values or input variables, then you statistically do the analysis of the data. You may use uh, t test, f test. We looked at so many tests in the past uh, um, say about 30 classes and then you derive conclusions. Based on that, we will say we will um, accept null hypothesis or uh, uh, we agree to reject null hypothesis. Then, uh, so we agree on alternate hypothesis, then we develop mathematical relation between various input parameters um, with the output parameter and then we formulate recommendation because of all these actually. So, we decide that uh, temperature should be only between 35 and 37, pH should be always acidic. So, these type of uh, recommendations we make based on our design study actually. Okay, these are the basic steps in design of uh, experiment. Okay. Um, if you look at design of experiments, historically it has been there uh, uh, from 1920s, early 1920s. So, it was used in agricultural, 
um, factorial designs were developed during agricultural studies. For example, um, studies were carried out to see whether this particular fertilizer uh, is better than that or this treatment of pesticide was better than that um, and how they performed on different types of land areas and how they performed with different plants. So, we had uh, many parameters and you cannot uh, do too many experiments. So, design of experiments uh, was um, thought of at that point of time that is 20s. Then came uh, sequential designs in the area of defense uh, and of course, by around the 50s um, chemical industries started using uh, these different types of designs. This is called response surface designs which was used for process optimization because ultimately in chemical industries they want to maximize the production of the desired product, minimize the usage of chemicals. So, the designs called response surface designs were incorporated in the early 50s. Then came the robust parameter design. As I said, uh, uh, I do not want my product quality or product performance to change too much with respect to my input values. So, it should be able to absorb these variations and that is called a robot, robust design that came into manufacturing and quality control. Okay. Even if uh, for example, the quality of my um, fuel uh, varies in a range, the performance of the car should be so robust enough to give you the same um, mileage per liter of the uh, fuel. That is called a robust design. Then came uh, virtual experiments using computational models. Design of experiments were also used in computer simulations, especially uh, for simulating semiconductor performance, aircraft uh, performance, automotive performance. So, uh, design of experiments was also started being used in um, mathematical modeling and simulation also. So, it is been there, it is being used in almost many fields of uh, um, science and engineering and um, biological engineering also has uh, um, taken it um, and they have started using uh, the various design of experiments tools in the biological research. Okay, let us go forward. Um, so, good experiments are always comparative, you know. Uh, if you are say comparing BP in subjects treated with placebo to BP in new drug. So, if you are looking at a drug, I will always compare it with the placebo. We talked about it many times in the course of uh, these weeks. So, um, either placebo or existing drug. So, if I want to say this new drug is better or as good with respect to placebo or existing drug. So, you need to do that. So, you may compare say male volunteers with female volunteers on the performance of a drug. So, always good experiments are comparative. We never uh, take historical controls and then compare it, that is very, very rare. So, if I want to uh, introduce a new drug into the market, I will always um, carry out um, clinical trials with the old drugs with a set of volunteers and um, new drug with a set of volunteers and make a comparison. Okay, that is always done. I will never take historical data, uh, the data of the performance of the old drug is given in the literature. So, I will take that and do it. That is not a good idea at all. Okay. So, it is always good to have set of volunteers for control or for old drug if you want to introduce a new drug into the market. So, um, comparison and control are very, very essential. We have been uh, looking at many problems um, in this uh, idea. Never never and compare with the historical controls. That is not a very good idea unless um, you do not have a control. For example, you can say uh, the lifespan of uh, people have increased from say 40 years uh, in the 19th century to almost 70 years. So, we can, if I want to do that sort of study, I may get volunteers in the current age, but I will not be able to get volunteers from in the 90s, 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 right? So, that is a problem. So, in such situations, of course, we cannot have a uh, comparison with the current concurrent controls, we have to make use of the historical controls only, okay, in such situations. But otherwise, it is always good idea to have concurrent control, okay, be it placebo, be it old drug, old assay, old volunteers, and so on, actually, okay. Uh, so, then next comes replication. We talked about replication or uh, um, 
reproduction, okay, um, that is very, very important. That means you carry out the entire experiment um, not just once, maybe twice, thrice, four, because that gives you an idea about the error. And if you want to get error sum of squares uh, without replication, it is very, very difficult. So, suppose I am looking at uh, blood pressure on control group and uh, those with treated, it is very bad idea to just do experiment with only one volunteer, okay, one of each. That is very bad because we have no idea about the error involved. But it is always a good idea, say you take 10 volunteers per group, so the blood pressure may vary of the control from say 85 to um, 97 and the treated could vary between 90 to 115. So, we have a range of uh, values, so we can calculate variances for the control, we can calculate variances for the treated, we can perform F test, um, so many things we can do, but with this we cannot do anything actually. So, just a single point control. So, replication of experiments is extremely crucial and uh, I also showed you before that when you do not have replication, it becomes very, very difficult to understand uh, error sum of squares or even uh, sometimes it is very difficult to understand confounding uh, or interactions. Okay. Okay. Why you replicate? Reduce the effect of uncontrolled variation. Okay. So, we increase the precision. Uh, quantify uncertainties because uh, any assay, any methodology will always have an error. So, replication helps you to find out what is the error margin. Um, so, replication is same as reproduce like I said, but it is not same as repeat. Repeat is just uh, taking a sample and uh, repeating the measurement in the instrument three times, but replication is by performing the entire experiment um, with the, the axis that is replication. Randomization, this is also very important, um, we have to randomize otherwise we will always have a bias. Um, if I am going to take uh, uh, say 20 volunteers, I will uh, put some of them into placebo and some of them into drug, I will randomly pick volunteers and put into these two groups. I will not um, go with certain bias. I will not take people who look healthy and put them into placebo or vice versa. That is not uh, correct. That is called biasing. Okay. So, we can randomize using uh, uh, there is a random number generator uh, software are there, table is there. So, if there are 20 volunteers, you can make them uh, ask them to stand in a queue and then use a random number generator or even uh, toss a coin and uh, pick them randomly and put them assign them into these two groups. That is the correct way of doing it rather than bringing in a bias, otherwise that is very, very dangerous. So, randomization is very important um, when we perform experiments. Why randomize? It avoids bias. So, randomly selected volunteers for control and test group rather than based on physical features. Like as I said, you know, we look at uh, people who look healthy and put them in uh, control, that is not correct, that is bias. Um, and um, if you look at healthy volunteers um, or unhealthy volunteers and put them into test uh, where we are going to give the drug, again that is not correct actually. Uh, that way um, we have the chance, randomization allows you to use the probability theory because the entire probability theory is based on random, tossing of coins, tossing of dice and so on actually. So, entire statistical analysis uh, techniques can be uh, applied if you use a random method rather than a biased method. Okay. Uh, next comes blocking or stratif stratification. So, for example, I am taking uh, some uh, say blood glucose measurement or a blood pressure measurement of uh, uh, volunteers with test group and control group. Uh, these may, uh, data will be made in the say morning or afternoon. Okay. So, if you think there is going to be some differences when I take uh, data in the morning or in the afternoon. That is true with the blood pressure or even with the uh, glucose. For example, blood pressure may be low in the mornings whereas it could be high in the afternoon. So, in such a situation, we can have equal number of subjects in each group, you know, that is called blocking. That way we can take account of the differences between periods in your design. Okay. So, uh, you do not have to worry. Um, their morning data collected and uh, afternoon data collected is going to give you problems. Okay. 
For example, you are testing a fertilizer in a field, um, okay, there are different types of field, um, so you do not, you are not very sure that whether that is going to affect your, um, uh, your the performance of a per fertilizer, then we can sort of uh, different types of lands could be blocked. Similarly, if you have different bags of raw materials for performing bioprocess experiments, um, suppose I take samples from one bag and do some experiments and take samples from another bag and do experiments. If I am worried that each bag may have some variations which may affect your results, then I can use bag as a block. Okay? So, uh, I will control, uh, I mean sorry, I will um, perform a measurement calculations only if, um, in each individual block and we can also later on do between block um, uh, analysis to see whether block has a effect. Okay? That is called blocking. Okay. So, uh, uh, look at this 20 males and 20 females I have, uh, half of them are going to be treated with drug, other half uh, left untreated or with placebo or old drug. Uh, I can do the treatment only for 4 volunteers per day. Okay? So, Monday to Friday only I am going to do the work. So, how will you assign individuals to the treatment groups on two days? Okay? So, I have 20 males, 20 females and uh, half of them in each group will be control. Uh, half of them in each group will be the test. So, how am I going to perform uh, this design plan? Okay, one design plan, uh, Monday I will have um, control, 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 female uh, and then uh, control, 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 uh, again uh, female on Tuesday like that okay. Okay. and then later on in the next week I may have the treated, treated, treated male. Okay. This is a very bad design. Okay. This is extremely bad because you are completing all of one set and then all of second set. There is no randomization, there could be bias coming into the picture. So, that is a very bad design. So, another alternate will be randomized design. So, what we do is we may take a treated person, a drug female and then uh, we could take a, a control male then we could take a control female and then we could take a um, treated uh, male, drug treated male. So, we have a, um, okay? so different types. Okay? So, we have a female and male taken here because we have pink and pink and blue and blue, but you also have treated control, control treated. Okay? That is on Monday. It is quite random. Next day, uh, we may take uh, two treated uh, um, male and two treated uh, control male. Uh, next day, we may have two treated um, female, two control female, like that. No, this is quite random. As you can see, it is randomly done. There is no pattern at all coming into the picture. This is called a randomized design. Uh, if you want to block it also, then uh, we can do it like this. Okay? So, we will have uh, the female. Okay, control and test together, then we have a, a male control and test together like that you know, you have some blocking. So, this is a block design like that you can do. So, uh, as you can see never, never have a design like this where uh, they, you complete one set of all the um, female uh, control, then you go into treated and so on. This is a very bad um, approach to do. Okay. Whereas, this is much better randomization and this is a blocking of uh, the data of male and female together. Okay. Uh, so, if you can fix a variable like uh, if you want to do only adult male, then it is ok, but the, if you do not fix a variable, then block it. That is, if you are going to take uh, both adult and old volunteers, then we can block with respect to the age. So, we um, have some group of uh, volunteers uh, adult, some group of volunteers who are old okay? and then um, you perform the experiments so, and then later on you can also look at effect of age also. Okay? That is a good, but if you can get only adult male between the age of 30 to 45, then no problem, age will not come into the picture. If you can neither fix nor block a variable, then better to randomize it because there could be situation 
where uh, you might not be able to um, get all uh, um, adult and old people. Suppose if you are testing some drugs for certain treatment, um, uh, most some diseases may happen only in certain type of population okay, or, and so on, then in some stages you randomize it. Okay. So, this is how we do uh, plan the experiments. Uh, now, there is something called factorial experiments. We look at these factorial, you are going to come across this word factorial quite often. Okay. So, imagine I am looking at a drug and a, um, diet for cholesterol lowering. So, you could have uh, uh, no drug drug and then normal diet high fat diet. Okay. So, you can have four different treatment strategies right no drug normal diet, no drug high fat diet. So, we can have a drug normal diet then finally, drug high fat diet. So, we have four different situations because you have two factors no drug no drug normal diet high fat diet. So, 2 into 2 4. So, by doing this we can learn more we can look at the effect of the diet we can look at effect of drug we can even look at effect of that is each one is a single factor um, and then we can even look at effect of drug and diet combined together also. Okay. So, that is the advantage. So, this is called a factorial experiment and um, we have two factors that is drug is one factor, diet is another factor and each at two levels that is no drug, drug, other one is normal diet, high fat diet. So, 2 into 2, 4. So, you will be doing 4 experiments. So, it is always better uh, to look at 4 different types of experiments. How do you do? We will take first experiment will be uh, no drug, normal diet that will be the first experiment and see the performance. Okay, no drug, normal diet. Next experiment could be uh, no drug, high fat diet. Okay. Third experiment could be uh, drug and normal diet. Fourth experiment could be with the drug and high fat diet. So, we are combining both these factors and getting four experiments. So, it is much better than doing single factor experiments. For example, single factor experiment could be uh, one experiment could be no drug, next experiment could be drug. Next uh, third experiment could be only with normal diet, fourth experiment could be high fat diet, no change in the drug pattern. Whereas, the factorial experiment we are changing both simultaneously in some situations that way we will be able to look at even interactions um, very efficiently. So, um, many design of experiments makes use of uh, factorial experiments or factorial designs. Okay. So, we are going to look at factorial designs. So, this is called a two level factorial design because we have two, two levels no drug drug or normal diet high fat and we have two variables here or two parameters here um, one is called the uh, drug parameter other one is called the uh, normal diet high fat diet uh, that is another parameter that is diet as another parameter. Okay. Um, so, we will talk about uh, these factorial experiment uh, in the subsequent classes. Thank you very much.